So as you can see up there, you can see my little handle is sciatic nerd. Uh, I'm on Twitter this way, and I've made sure to use the same silly uh, profile picture so that you can find me no matter where you look. You will be like, oh, it's that guy. Yeah, okay. So meanwhile, what are we here to do today? We're here to talk about well, a lot, it looks like, because that's a really busy slide. But I want you to understand something. We're here together. We're in this together. We're only going to go so far today, but I want to cover, by analogy, some of the things you may or may not have ever come across in PKI, because let's face it, this is about getting the beginnings and the foundation down. This is a foundational talk. If you're just frothing at the mouth to bring some crypto knowledge with you, I appreciate you very, very much, and I'm likely to glaze over like a ham during the holidays. It's just not gonna take all that well. The reason I mention all this is that I come from a keyboard that won't respond. There it goes. I come from a background that is media-centric. Uh, I talk too much. I get nervous. I like to make jokes and voices and do silly things because I'm up here in a suit trying to impress all of you and everyone I've actually walked up to and said <laughs> today, they said, relax. Three deep breaths. And then, why are you dressed in a suit? It's last call, relax. This is a group of your peers, these people who are going to at least listen to you for at least five minutes before they start digging deeply into Twitter. But that's okay. So what we have here is a background that suggests uh, I've been in this industry for 11 years. I started out as a filmmaker. I was that kid who hung out in the AV room hiding from the rest of the world when I was seven, in seventh grade and beyond. And then somehow along the way, uh, information security became the call. It wasn't something I originally intended to get into, but there it is. But my background now is, I've been doing this uh, with PKI, working with PKI, for, well gosh, it's been 11 years. And I was a registration authority for nine and a half of those. So the scarring is permanent, but it's gonna be okay. I like to think of myself as a cross between uh, Shatner and Kelsey Grammer when it comes together, which is why I've got them up there kind of crossed up in a Star Trek kind of reference, because I know I'm a big nerd. I mean, a big nerd. And that's okay, because once I've talked you through it for a few minutes and you start to nod off from the awesome lunch they provided us here, you'll see that there's nothing to be afraid of with all the talking that I do. This presentation is to help explain to people who have maybe not worked as much with this technology, what it actually does. A lot of folks have approached me in the past or I've overheard at other conferences. You know what? How dare this person come and speak to us about PKI? We know PKI. And then all the talks begin with N sub one, sub two, math. N <laughs> and I don't want to do that to you. I'm going to chew the microphone and yell at you a little. But no, I, I want to be able to share for people who are non-majors, those who want to understand how these pieces move back and forth. I just came from an awesome talk about OpenStack. Did any of you go to that OpenStack presentation? It was actually really awesome because I was not sure what they were going to cover and they were suddenly talking all about key management, remote automated key management, which actually directly comes up in the talk I'm about to share with you. And I like to reference XKCD wherever <laughs> possible because there are certain times the comics that, they come, that the, the folks at XKCD come up with are just so perfect if you've ever had to support anyone else. So I can't help but want to share these things with you. All right. On with the show. But wait, we know PKI. As a very good friend originally shared with me as he was dragging me through learning CISSP cryptography material, and he did this awesome representation of cryptography using a big padlock and a tennis ball. And I said, oh, okay, but how do I understand what this is really for? We all know crypto, sure we do. We know it's a big fat word, we know it makes us lots of money, keeps us fed, keeps our kids in clothes, and maybe even helps us learn and understand new things because that's what drives us. But maybe we wanna know a little bit of a different way of how this works from the beginner's point of view, because that's who this is for. And uh, apologies to those who came up with those awesome references for explaining deep crypto things. We're going to talk about a very brief, um, simplified version, if you will, if you'll accept it, of PKI brokered authentication. So basically, forget all the other bits and the passing of, of moduli and other pieces of information. Let's pay attention to presentation, examination, chaining, or looking to see 
what route it's supported by, and validation or revocation checking. So check me out, bro. Is it, well, so wait, let me, let me check out and make sure that you're the right person for this job or at least the right entity to represent this organization. And have you actually uh, been validated? Are you supposed to be here? So that's the quick dirty right there. So, so far I've breezed through it because, again, it's just about trying to understand how the pieces work together, which now requires we talk about a brief moment of authentication versus authorization. Who here already gets this completely? Raise your hand if you already get the, who here's awake? Raise your hand. Okay, at least there are a couple more hands. Cool, thank you, I do appreciate that. So authentication being the part that actually describes that we are who we say we are, or at least we're attempting to assert that. We want to make sure that the individual presenting or the entity presenting some kind of credential actually is who they say they are. Pretty straightforward, right? So I came to realize, I don't know how many bazillions of years into this, that the pin is actually on a token, if you've ever used a smart card, in many cases, to challenge the holder of the token. It's not to protect your data, it's to make sure that theoretically it's the something you have, the something you know, and you're using those two factors to check your own head. You wanna make sure that you're actually the person who's holding that card, therefore you use it. Well, once I'm in the door, because that's what the authentication generally grants, access to the building, let's say. This is a fictitious building, by the way, not anything specific. It's the idea that you get inside using the smart card and you said, aha, I have presented my electronic identity. This building could just as easily be a whole host of websites using a single sign-on method. Let's say you're using uh, Google's authentic, uh, Google or, uh, help me out here, what were the other large systems of single sign-on methods that are out there? What do we have? We have uh, Windows Live ID, uh, you've got, doesn't Facebook now use a standardized one? Was it Open ID, isn't it? Uh, and, and others. So this is all the same idea. You're inside the system. So what are you allowed to do? Well, that's your authorization, right? <coughs> so it describes what the authenticated individual or entity is allowed to do. The, whatever presented that information or those credentials now gets to do something. And the holy grail in this area is some kind of on-the-fly provision. The idea that, what are you allowed to do? Well, say I work for company A, and I'm trapped inside my little silo over here, and someone has a piece of information, and they're in another country, but they have the database you need access to. So the idea being that without having to call someone up, worry about what time it is, go through a bunch of paperwork, try to argue between your boss that it's important you do it, do I have to fly somewhere or drive somewhere, blah, blah, blah. You'd just be able to say, oh, we trust the credentials that came from company A. What a great idea. What a fantastic concept. What a colossal pain in the neck. But this is where it's all headed with federated credentials. Another way of saying this kind of, uh, it's actually not role-based, it's a, a back-end attribute exchange, which sounds a little odd when you think about back-end attribute exchange. So it's just passing it back and forth. And if you went to that presentation earlier, about OpenStack, that's what Barbican is. It's an automated solution that's being built for the cloud to help protect keys and automate the passing of things from here to there. And we have to build the trust, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, or at least the baboon holding the microphone is. So on with the show. Certificates, they're like autographs. So a photo of your favorite actor or actors is useless or meaningless or has little value other than being a photo of a person whose work you appreciate unless they've signed it and you can prove they've signed it. Another way to think of it, of course, still is if you went to a university, saw what the diploma looked like, went home, used Photoshop or Print Shop for that matter, and went ahead and printed yourself one and signed it off, you could say you were a doctor of physics, except that it's not worth anything. So it all matters who signs it because we trust, supposedly, the entity that signed it. Welcome to the certificate authority, or the certification authority. So if the provost and the president, or the people who are appointed at that level, have the authority to sign off and make that sheet of paper mean more than just a sheet of paper, then that's who we're trusting. We're placing our ability to believe that this came from the right source based on that signature. And that's what a CA does. A request is presented to the certification authority, 
on behalf of a user or organization or entity, and the CA signs off on it. whoop de doo We get it. However, certificates are meant to be an electronic form of trust. How far do we trust them? Well, that's a good question. That depends entirely on your organization and the way you implement it. Well, I want to be able to trust somebody to not just load and unload the trash. Well, maybe automated certificates that are created when you click a button on the website somewhere, that's enough to say, yeah, if you've gotten this far, we'll, we're willing to trust you without ever laying eyes on you or having any human interaction. But that's not really trust, is it? I mean, if I want to trust somebody, imagine a mob movie, a bad mob movie. They always have the same thing, where they bring in the mobster, who want, the guy who wants to be a mobster, they send him down, they talk to him, they threaten him, they threaten the kids, they, they go to even, they break a finger, a leg, something to say we're serious and do you really want to do this. It happens in all the action movies too. Oh, how committed are you? And that establishes that trust. Well, in the same way, you have assurance levels or trust levels, depending on how much rigmarole has to be gone through to obtain a certificate. All right. That brings up, just briefly, self-signed certificates. Yeah, here's a great idea. I am going to print out my own certificate of completion uh, from MIT. I am a genius in my own mind. I'm a legend in my own mind. I can do whatever I want. I've printed it. I've put it on the wall. I love me. And no one else is going to believe you. No one else is going to trust you. Everyone will start to wonder if the jacket you're wearing is a little straighter than it ought to be. Fine. You have to use a source people trust, which opens up a lot larger doors. And that brings up what I'm referring to as chaining. And this is done by analogy of a wholesale club. Uh, anyone here have a, uh, a, an account, has a membership to a wholesale club? Yes, yes, at least two people. Everyone else buys their toilet paper at the regular store. Me, I'm going to cart whole things home. I have so much deodorant, I'm probably set for another six years. One guy, real simple, wholesale club. But how does it work when you go to the wholesale club? You walk up to the wholesale club and there is a gate guard. The gate guard stops you and says, please show me your ID. You whip out that membership card to that organization. This establishes the concept of the certificate root chain. So basically, somebody higher up in the authority food chain decided we are going to make an ID that looks like this. This is what it's going to look like. Here's the information it's going to contain. It was all decided on. And they said, that's how it's going to work. We agree to that. Move it down the line. And so people down all the way down at the next level lower said, we're going to go ahead and issue IDs to people that represent our organization, our club. So let's think of it in terms of a club. What club do you belong to? Well, you can see there you've got Shams Club and Lost Co. And each of those, I'm not going to be able to walk up with the Lost Co. card and say, hello, my name is Mr. Turing. I would like to get into Sham's Club. They're not going to let me in. Why? Because it's obviously not from that club. They're going to look at it on its face, and at face value, be able to tell me right away, nope, you don't belong here. I think you want to go across the street where the other guys are, and that's how I'm going to be able to tell, because the gate guard looked at it. Well, this is when presenting electronic credentials to a website or a service that service will be able to look at your certificate, at the guts of your certificate. It'll kind of just unzip the thing, look inside, and go, ooh, that's not mine. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Sorry, you're turned away. Don't come here. With that in mind, we now understand the concept of a root chain or a trust chain. And why is it, I ask you all, who are kind enough to join me here today, why there's never one standard statement, there have to be 14 versions of the same silly thing. There's always some other version of it. It's not, it's a, you're gonna issue leaf certificates? Leaf certificates? We're going with root, chain, tree, leaf. Why don't you just call it an ent entity certificate? No, no, I'm a large corporation. I'm gonna call this an EV certificate. Wait, what? I just want a certificate that represents my identity to go do things. Well, wait, how much of that are we going to let you have? What is your certificate going to be allowed to do? Well, I have to choose the right group of people because, excuse me, the right organization to get my cert from. I'm getting the cert from an organization that I'm going to hopefully be able to play well with others. 
Because if I buy a membership to Shams Club and drive across town or go to another state, they might not have a Shams Club. So what good are my credentials there? Useless. Make sure you get the right toys to work with the right equipment. Okay, so now let's talk about the next part. On the surface of it, it was possible when using the previous example that when entering the wholesale club, they looked on the card and they said, yep, looks like you. Yep, not really expired. Come on in. Well, this doesn't take into account the other part of this, where you examine the certificate more closely and see if you're on some kind of no-fly list. This is called certificate revocation checking or validation checking. And this is kind of represented by a nightclub bouncer. We've all seen those TV shows where the group of people are in a line about three million miles long. They're trying to get inside the room and they just can't because there's a person, a very large burly person, standing there with a clipboard. And if your name's on the list, you're allowed to come by or if you slip them a 20 or something. But the idea is there's this clipboard and you have to get inside. And how do you do that? You wanna make sure you're on that list. In this case, it's the opposite. Certificate revocation checking is actually a list of bad certificates or certificates that were revoked because someone left a company or they were found to be doing something they shouldn't be doing. So they're on this no list. The no list is our revocation list and it's called the certificate revocation list. And as you can imagine, if you've got a fairly large organization, this would be one heavy clipboard because there's lots of different people in organizations. And so imagine a clipboard that's holding papers that are about three feet thick. Well, that kind of gets to be a pain in the neck or arms. But even if they are burly, it doesn't matter. It's too big to dig through. It takes too long. Everything's too slow. So they have to come up with these other technologies that simplify and make it more efficient. And there are other methods that go with that too. But you get the idea. All right. Hauling through, checking time. All right. So not just clubs, but stores. Why don't we trust everybody? Well, that's an obvious question. It's never a good idea to trust just everybody. Kids are told not to talk to strangers. Don't just trust that person who tries to hand you candy. Well, isn't that what we do all the time on the internet? Oh, please, share your information with me. Now, this audience, I am strongly suspecting, is not going to have this problem. Just because Face Nook or, you know, someone else's space or Twitter or something else says, I'd like to share your information. Please click here and allow me to take everything that you've put into our system for free and sell you like a product. Well, that's not always a great idea. Same thing goes true and holds true for certificates. We shouldn't just trust everybody. We have to be selective, but it's hard to know who to trust. It's, it's complicated. There are a lot of options. There are lots of different organizations, but you can't delete them all because it's true if you actually went into Microsoft Windows and deleted all of the trust chains listed in there, your computer would stop working. It has to have certain code signing certificates to keep operating. And some of these certificates are years and years expired and out of date, but they're still rotting there like some kind of zombified authentication mechanism because without it, the whole thing breaks down. But that's the other part of this. There are more certificate stores tucked away on our computers than a Hollywood has-been has had done to their features. Trust stores are stuck in everything, from Adobe Acrobat to Java and lots of other little tucked away nooks and crannies. So folks get very confused and turned around. I come to this point to explain this or to share it, not to explain it, you already get this, but to share the fact that after hundreds of calls, if not thousands, of people saying, but I made sure it was in the Windows Certificate Store, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, it has to be in the right location. Location, location, location. And there are plenty of good examples out there on the internet from the last few years, and even from Mr. Galbraith's talk earlier today, Nick's talk, his keynote, plenty of opportunities to realize that not all trust is created equal, and not all organizations should be trusted. So let's take some of these concepts and apply them real quick. If you don't have one of those awesome OpenStack systems where it's all just handed for you, it means that you or your developers or your admins are at some point going to come across having to request a certificate. And it is hugely important, I cannot stress this enough, it is hugely important that you understand what step you're on. Do not pass go, do not go home, do not go on a bender, do not go on a binge and leave it for the night shift. Write down where you were. 
Imagine you're playing Myst and it's 1994. You gotta remember what part of the steam tunnels you left off in when you had to go to bed or go to class, or whatever you were doing. You must know where you left off, and this little checklist on the bottom, treat it like a checklist. There's always going to be a trust store that you're gonna be sticking a private key into. I treat this like a pie metaphor, not only because I like pie and it's obvious, but because this particular cookbook that's on this slide starts the same way no matter where you go. It starts with a recipe for crust. It doesn't matter what kind of pie you like. Crust is always the starting point. And how you make your crust is important. And how you base or start your certificate request is just as important. Know the tool you're about to use or find an easier one to use. If you're not sure what you're about to do and you're just gonna wing it, realize in most cases it's a pay for exercise. There's going to be a human being at some point on the other end looking over this request and they're going to process what they're handed because they're under the impression that the person submitting it knows what they're doing. It's a fairly obvious action. I made, I clicked the button, I'm responsible, I did it. But then we get back the result and we can't figure out which end is up. Why not? We didn't write down where the heck we were. So what changes? If crust is always the same, it's actually the filling that's always going to be different. It's the guts of the certificate that make all the difference. And if we know where we are putting all the bits to our certificates and we've talked to the support people before we submit, there are lots of processes in this frustrating technological life that are back-end loaded. PKI, I put to you, is not one of them. PKI is a planned process. Please take the time to save yourself the headache. You can see I don't have much hair left and I owe a lot of that loss to PKI in my opinion because a lot of folks just willy-nilly go click in the mouse and the next thing I know I'm on an hour call trying to talk someone down from a technological ledge. I'm sure you've all had similar kinds of experiences. How many developers are in this room? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, have you ever had to request a certificate? Anybody? Who here has ever had to manually request one of these? One, two, three. How many headaches have you had because of this process? It's 10, 20, 30, well that's a lot, that's a lot of headaches. You might, we can get you some Excedrin. But it's, it's a very laborious task and one that nobody likes doing. And I don't know why it just advanced on me. It's getting ahead of me, it wants me to move on. The point, and it's probably a good point, but the point is, in these slides, there is a real basic concept. When you're making your request, don't tell anyone else I told you this. Back up your private key. If it's possible to get the private key and safely store it offline only, back up your private key. It's like making yourself a get out of jail free card. But realize, this get out of jail free card is an I hosed you card a thousand times over if anything bad happens to it. So recognize this is the most important part of this nutritious and tasty pie making breakfast but consider it as an option that will help save you hours of time and frustrating calls where other people who are left to pick up the task don't know where to go from here. All right. This dovetails into why would we choose to do things this way? Why would we take these pains, go to these lengths to have to talk to somebody and sign away half your life and send part of your child's left toe to someone in another city to try and authenticate who you are or what you're trying to accomplish. It's called governance and everybody hates it and they hate the person who has to wear that hat and sit there and say, no, no, that's not how that works. No, you can't do that. No, I'm sorry you're not authorized to do that, please. No. And then you get into arguments about it and policy arguments are like playing a game of operation with five-year-olds arguing about what is written in the box top and they go on and on forever and what else what other entertainment value related thing can you imagine you've ever done in your life that you spent hours arguing over anybody here ever play any tabletop games of any kind how about drunken scrabble i'm, I'm a fan of drunken scrabble that's a pretty good one you ever try to have an argument with somebody over whether queenie is a word and they look in the book and you know there's a house rule that you have to take a shot or lose a turn or something worse if it's not a word. That's what policy arguments are all day long. And when you think about it, it kind of explains why there's so much scotch involved with people who write or work with policy. 
because it really is a horrifying experience. It's not always glamorous. It's a pain because you're talking about the rules. And everybody wants to argue about the rules, but no one wants to be responsible for the rules. And this brings up a huge point. On the right there is a graphic that represents an information assurance policy chart. Now, this isn't anything super secret or crazy. This is available at no cost on the website that's listed in excruciatingly tiny text on the bottom, but I assure you, you can find this using your favorite search engine of choice. What can be seen here is actually a massive list of how to protect something. Each of those little bubbles represents a separate multi-page document. And when I say multi-page, I do not mean small. I do not mean it's going to be easy, and in fact, it's going to be confusing as heck. Why? What is the problem here? Well, it's policy. It's not glamorous. And in fact, it takes months of meetings and back and forth with people to agree, or at least disagree, to the point where it slides through unnoticed. Because success in policy is measured by how long you're able to hold a grudge. If you're able to sit there and keep that grudge alive, or your point, I delicately refer to it as a grudge, then you will have the ability to win. What is winning? Winning in policy land is the ability to carry an idea all the way to fruition and make sure it's in the document because it actually matters. And if this is your livelihood and affects other human beings and you do care about some of those, then it's worth it to usually get this set up correctly. This entire conference and so many like it are predicated on the idea that we give a care, that's why we showed up. Not just for the really awesome breakfast or a t-shirt or a bag or even the ability to see our friends. So if this matters, let me share something with you. Haven't you been sharing something with us for over 30 minutes? As a matter of fact, I have. But this is an open source Intel moment about cybersecurity in the world at large. It's a small piece of analysis that I'm sure many of you are aware of. And it is that PKI isn't new. It's been in production for years and the ideas that found, or are the foundation of PKI have been around much, much longer. The rise or return of the smart card in the United States is coming within the next three to five years. Anybody remember the American Express blue card? Yeah. How about EMV, which is the Europay, MasterCard, Visa card? Yeah, lots of folks bandy that about at conferences, at really high-tech conversations, all about how they can uh, circumvent it and do nasty things with it. Well, guess what? There's a whole new version of it coming, because the only place it really didn't take off where it was launched was here. Everywhere else, it is implemented, and it's often it's running with its ugly facts about how it can be exploited in certain ways. So what do we have? Years ago, there was an external PKI that individuals or organizations had to interface with in order to work with the government. If you had to communicate or authenticate from the outside going in, you had to go and get an ECA, External Certification Authority Certificate, at not a little bit of cost. Well, after a few years, it became obvious that other organizations in the industry could actually take steps and establish their own. And they realized the cost of entry was a little higher at first, but they could then issue all the certificates they wanted to all of their individuals so that they could individually interact with their government counterparts without so much money being spent or time taken. Why? Because the company took ownership of having this. So over the years, the industry folks have several PKI uh, infrastructures, redundant, redundant, excuse me, but th there are several versions that they have stood up of their own from large firms and organizations, which has led to, oh look, we've figured out more things. We should actually take some of that on. We've learned a lot of lessons. Let's do this again. It was so much fun the first three times. There's another version coming based on the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. Who here has heard of it? One. Who knows when it was signed? Sadly, it's me, because I'm that guy. In April of 2011, it was important that this got signed because it meant something is starting. 
PKI is planned for. It's not an instant on kind of thing. So the planning, the ball started rolling two years ago already. What does this mean? The end stick, as it's affectionately referred to by the nerds, can be found at idmanagement.gov. And herein lies the rub. It's not an easy site to navigate. It's full of big documents with words that are a buck 25 each. And they're very highfalutin words, and it's all obfuscated because it's hard. Hopefully, this presentation just makes some of the real basics obvious, so that if you ever had to go get a cert, you at least have a source you can point back to and say, this lunatic was on stage talking about pi. And that reminded me about how PKI is supposed to go. But in a concept of second verse, same as the first, um, The end stick led us to these different layers of PKI in, hinted at in the diagram on the right. These are each iterations. I see them as fractal, I call it a fractal iteration kind of thing. So you did it once, you learn something, you do it again. You learn something, you do it again. And since it's obvious to me at this point that we're about to see it happen again, we're going to have to have not just, anyone here work in an organization that has to deal with hazmat? No? Okay, so you've got to maybe ship things from point A to point B. There's a requirement that individuals who handle that shipping stuff have to communicate with Hazmat and get stuff signed. And they have to communicate back and forth and report what they're shipping and get specialized labels. And it's all pushed out. It's not pulled, because who wants to pull? No one wants to pull. People want to be told, hey, hey, there's a change coming. Um, so you're going to have to change to using this new TPS report over here starting next week. But that's not how this really works. The game is, we're only going to share a piece of what you need to do. And we're going to stop at this line right here. I'm not crossing this line. It's up to you to come to this line and see what's new. Well, then how am I, the mom and pop shop, the company, the organization, how am I going to know about that? I'm not. So guess what happens, kids? Policy development has a cyclical flow. It started two years ago and the ball is rolling. This is an opportunity to get involved at this stage because the documentation being published and released is open for comment and it's closing all the time. Imagine a series of windows being opened that are closing all the time so that at some point in the future when a document comes out that says, well, I'm so sorry, I can't accept that document from you anymore. Didn't you see the updates? We're switching to a completely new electronic system. You have to have one of these cards, or, or you can't play. Well, I don't have a card. What, what are you talking about? Well, we published it last year. There was a complete open thing. I mean, we published it in the Federal Register. Didn't you read the Federal Register? No? There's an iPad app for that. Do you know that? So it, it, it was an accident. I went looking for something else, probably something about cheese. And the next thing I know, bam, I found that there are these uh, steering committees. I went looking for one thing and fell down a rabbit hole. And these steering committees actually contribute to how the working groups that exist below them, see there's a hierarchy here, so the steering committees decide what needs to be done. The steering committee then sets up working groups and engineering groups and they discuss all the relevant things of the day. And what comes out of this? Let's look at the chart here on the side. Things start generally as RFCs. Okay, this is a nerdy group. What's an RFC? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for waking up. I appreciate that. This is your wake up call. We have 15 minutes to go, maybe less. By the way, thank you all very much for hanging in there. So, RFCs lead to anger, which leads to hate, which leads, no, wrong one. RFCs lead to standards, which are commonly published by organizations like NIST. Those standards are then adopted by policymakers who exist in these working groups because they cite those standards. So people tend to look at the internet RFC as a nice innocuous framework, an idea. But that idea has consequences. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Something gets done. But then, if you've ever been in a moment where you look down at a process and you see all the broken parts and say, what happened? 
Did anybody actually talk to anyone else who mattered about this? Who cares about this? This opens the door for an opportunity to get involved. Something like, I am the cavalry. How fortuitous. Organizations that happen to care have an opportunity for people to get involved and make a difference. Whether it's through that or on your own as a representative of industry or a private citizen who just happens to give a flip, it is a worthwhile thing to dig into one issue. Don't pick all of them. You won't sleep. I know I haven't. As you start to chase down some of these pieces and try to see where they fit, it's kind of a weird reverse engineering process to kind of build the stack to see why these things are so convoluted. Because people sometimes who you would not even imagine having involvement in these talks are present. And then the, uh, the usual suspects or trust specs are usually involved as well. And remember that silence is an indication that we can just keep going because there's no one who stands to oppose us. Well, that just doesn't seem right. So to cover what we've covered in the covering of this cover, we have looked at the building blocks of authentication versus authorization. The concept of how certificates only matter when they're signed by somebody we care about or trust. What kind of trust and which club we belong to establish where those certificates are able to be used. And we have to check in this process of trying to get in somewhere to make sure that our certificate isn't on a no list somewhere, certificate revocation. All of this just has to remind us that even though we think we've done everything correctly from a techie point of view, check which certificate store you're working with. Just because it's on a Windows box or a Linux box doesn't mean it's always going to be in the same place. Each and every browser has its own trust store. Chrome happens to have the wonderful ability to use its own or point to the one in Windows, which is great when you're working on Windows. And then you load that happy little virtual machine that's running Chrome all by itself in Ubuntu or some other flavor. And you suddenly discover there's no shared trust store. Where's that trust store? And a new quest, a side quest begins. And then anyone who's ever played any of those online games knows we all hate side quests. We just want to get done what we came to do. Beyond that, we tried to cover the idea that Pi is a good thing, even doubly so when thinking of PKI. The process has you, just know where you left off. And it will be easier, far easier, to accomplish your goal, which is to save your precious hair follicles, or at least your blood pressure. And lastly, we want to talk about governance and policy. Stay classy. It's very easy to devolve into some kind of food fight or shouting match. Goodness, I know I've had a few of them. Sometimes, sadly, in public, at conferences that are not like these. And people have but one goal in mind, their own agenda. And that's what we have to bury here if we really want to get something done sometimes. It's far better to get involved, involved, excuse me, and pursue that better goal rather than just fall into obscurity and not know what's going on and then just accept what comes up as it happens. I stick my head in the sand personally about the local news because if I wanted to watch uh, a death match or, or the uh, tally scoreboard, I would go look at the websites for the uh, capture the flag from cons or I'd go and watch someone play uh, some first person shooter. That's how I generally tend to view the news right or wrong a lot of times. What this results in is sometimes uh, current events get away from me, which is why I am thankful there is Twitter. Because in one last quick reference, Twitter is like headlines. Headlines lead to articles. So follow the people who say things you care about so you can find their articles. Oh wait, that means the internet has basically become a deconstructed newspaper. Well, that's one way to stay current. After all of this, I just want to thank you for your time and your attention and uh, your forbearance. Do you have any questions of any kind? If not, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of LastCon. Have a great afternoon.